somebody didn't like me slurping the last time I uh, drank coffee, so I'll try and drink carefully today. So today is a big one. So I really want to put this project in a bit of context. So just before my fourth birthday, my father came to me and said, you need a tape recorder. I had no idea what he was talking about. I needed it, didn't even know what it was. So he explained to me that a tape recorder was a thing that would allow you to store sound and play sound back and create your own sound. I wasn't quite sold on this idea, but anyway, I, I sort of went with it. So on my fourth birthday, as promised, I got this tape recorder and I was shown how to use it. I had one cassette, which we put in the uh, tape player and away I went. You have to think back to a time before home computers, before cell phones, before all of that stuff. The future was still very mechanical at this point. So I made my first recording. I rewound the cassette and played it back. And besides the noise of the machine itself actually imprinting onto the sound, it was amazing. So I was pretty impressed. But then something more amazing happened. The plug was removed and it still worked. You could put massive cells in the back of this and boy, this used a lot of batteries. So so this used six C cells to give you some idea of how clunky this is. And instantly I could go anywhere and through this little microphone, record any sound, store it and play it back whenever I want. It came with a little carry handle and I would carry this thing around everywhere. But this started the absolute fascination of creating sound, storing it and being able to play it back. So I purchased my Series 3 Fairlight about 10 years ago at this point. I had to make a choice. Did I go for a Series 1, 2 or 2X? Which is what most people think of when they think of a Fairlight. I ended up choosing the Series 3. The reason was the sounds I wanted to create at the time were a lot longer than one or two seconds. And believe it or not, the early Fairlights can only record somewhere between one to three seconds of sound. It didn't stop playing on my mind that I really wanted that original Fairlight. So as you probably already know, Fairlights were incredibly expensive and they didn't make too many of them. There's probably over all the series, somewhere between three to 400 that were ever made. Over the years, some of these have been thrown away. Some of these are broken. Some of these are in people's garages. They just spread throughout the world and in various states of repair and disrepair. So the amount of long-term owners of Fairlights out there are very small and uh, a lot of us tend to know each other. So a few years ago, my friend David Morley uh, posted on the Fairlight group that he'd managed to pick up what he thought was a Series 1. So looking at the picture, I thought at the time, that's possibly a 2X, not a Series 1. A few years pass, and then David posts to the Fairlight group that he's thinking of selling that actual Fairlight. So in its day for the 8-bit samplers, this was the top of the line Fairlight. I instantly messaged David, I need it. I need to have this Fairlight. Now the big problem was David's in Belgium, which means moving very large and very heavy samplers around the planet is gonna be very costly. So also the biggest thing that concerns me at this moment is also how we're gonna ship the monitor and the monitor looks very worse for wear. I, I'm a bit worried at this point that the monitor is actually blown. When the CRT loses its vacuum, it normally ends up with a similar look to the screen. So, so I'm a bit nervous that I'm buying a very broken monitor. So over a few weeks, David and I agree on a price. He sends me some more pictures of the system and then we start figuring out how we're gonna ship it. So about two weeks ago at this point, after many difficult days of dealing with customs and having to pay a ridiculously large import tax, this massive crate turns up on the back of a courier van and it is so heavy, they can't even get it through my door. So I had to unpack it outside. So you can't really see how windy it is out there. 
I've got packing peanuts going absolutely everywhere, which is why I'm sort of keeping the lid over the box as much as I can as I try and wrestle things out. So the big challenge is getting the mainframe out. There's no way I'm going to be able to lift it through the top. So obviously I've got to take the side off, which means packing peanuts are going everywhere. And like I said, they not only are everywhere in the house, but they're everywhere in the garden. And I have to go and clean that up first before I can unpack the Fairlight. So I'm packing the Fairlight. This is where I get to see how well everything was packed. And I don't mind saying we used Mailboxes Inc. in Belgium and they did a fantastic job. Everything arrived in perfect condition. Well, as good as condition as it left. Time to get the mainframe out of the box. Now, this is where I'm always concerned the cards are gonna get damaged, but everything looks good. The monitor probably, again, looks worse than I thought, and the system together, yeah, it's rough. One of the big problems with old computers is they tended to use batteries, physical batteries, on the PCBs to actually run clocks and to save data and memory. The Fairlight has one that is known to degrade over time and pretty much destroy the entire board if it's not removed. So I've been a bit nervous. Is this going to be okay on the 133 card? Is the battery still in one piece? And it's even better, the battery's been removed, so we're in a good place to start with. The system looks pretty rough, and including the import duty and shipping, I've paid a lot of money for this system. So I need to feel good about this project, and I need to sense that it's moving forward. So let's get some quick wins on the table. The first thing we're gonna take a look at is the faceplate. Now this is gonna be a good indicator of once it's cleaned up, once I've removed all the dirt and the sticky tape and everything else that's on there, how good is the system gonna come up from a aesthetic point of view. So the first thing I need to do is get rid of the tape that's on the faceplate. It sort of turns into a glue that is very hard to remove without scratching things. So I find if you use WD-40, just let it sit a while, it'll eventually just degrade and come off really, really easy. And I must say, um, it looks like I'm scrubbing this thing to death, but I'm going quite lightly over the screen printing just to make sure I don't pull it off or scratch it off. Of course, there's two sides, so I'll give the back a clean as well. And I must say, even, even at this point, it's starting to look so much better. So time to give it a rinse off and just let it dry before putting it back together. Wow, that came up so much better than I was expecting. I was expecting it to come up quite well, but it basically looks brand new. Time to do the keyboard. Now, I want this to look as factory fresh as I can get it. So it means a complete tear down. I'm gonna remove all the keys. I'm going to clean it more than it probably was clean before it was painted originally and then we'll repaint it and we'll see how good we can get this. So the original paint used has a texture to it. I can't get texture paint at a decent price so what I'm going to do is hope that where the texture is still available on the keyboard and it's still there that if I spray over that and just spray the areas that the texture is now gone it'll all sort of blend in a way that looks as close as possible to factory fresh. 
Okay, maybe I'm going to be a bit OCD here. I could have cleaned in between the keys, but I'm going to remove them all. I'm going to put them in a bucket of soapy water. I'm going to leave them overnight and I'll come back and reassemble the keyboard tomorrow. So the keyboard base is in really good condition. It's not really dirty, it's just dusty. As you can see, it's pretty mint. But of course, as I said, the uh, surround, the metal surround for the keyboard is showing its age. So the bottom is taking a bit more work. For some reason, somebody had sprayed the metal where the paint had come away with a white paint. Or maybe that was the original texture paint that the black paint was painted over the top of. No matter what, I need to get that off. Otherwise, the new paint will not adhere. So I'm really going hard. As you can see, those bristles are really flexing. Once again, rinsing everything off, letting it dry, and then on to the spray booth. Okay, maybe I was a bit optimistic there. It's a nice warm day, so the paint's going to adhere really well, and it's going to cure very fast. So I'll be able to get a few coats in, and we should be able to get this complete today. Like I said, this cleaning is going to be a bit obsessive. I'm even going to clean the cable. The cable is actually quite clean already, but it's good just to get all the years of gunk off. So we're up to the final coat. So I left the keys out to dry totally overnight. They came up super well, and I just reassembled the next morning. Space bars. Oh, space bars are always tricky. There's always a retaining mechanism to keep the space bar from flopping from one side to the other. And almost all keyboards, they use little clips and the clips are about 40 years old on this keyboard. And once again, I am super happy with how this has turned out. This is so much better than I expected. I, I was sure that where I'd lost the texture paint that it would look, you know, very different to the rest of the keyboard, but it really comes up well. I think it's mostly because it's black, and because it's black it sort of hides any imperfections or anything like that. But even for, once again, a literal backyard spray job, it looks great. It really looks new. So it's going to take me a while to restore this fair light. So next time we'll do some more cosmetic work and we'll start working on bringing up the computer. Thank you for watching and I'll chat to you next time.